Hello friends! All right, this is The White Giraffe by Lauren St. John and today is our first day of reading it. So I'm just going to jump right into the chapter one. I know that I read this page last time, but I'm going to read it again so we can hear all of chapter one at once. Just to warn you, it is a very sad chapter. I did peek ahead at this one. So let's do this. Okay. Also, that sound is my dog again, and I'm sorry, but what can you do? Okay. Excuse my comfy clothes outfit, but I feel like that has to be a rule of reading a chapter book is that you get to be as comfy as possible, right? All right, here we go. <clears throat> People like to say that things come in threes, but the way Martine looked at it, that all depends on when you start counting and when you stop. For instance, she could say that one bad thing happened along with three good things, but the truth was that the one bad thing was the very worst thing in the whole world. Another was so small she didn't really notice it at the time, and something else that she first thought was bad luck later turned out to be the best kind of fortune anyone could ever wish for. Whichever way you added it up, though, one thing was certain. The night Martin Allen turned 11 years old was the night her life changed completely and was never the same again. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> it was New Year's Eve. At the time, Martine was asleep in bed and she was dreaming about a place she'd never been to before. The reason she was so positive was because it was too beautiful ever to forget. As far as the eye could see, there were lawns lined with exotic flowers and trees. Behind them, rising into a clear sky, was a mountain made majestic by granite cliffs and lush green forest. <clears throat> Children were laughing and chasing moths through beds of dusky pink flowers, and in the distance, Martine could hear drums and soaring voices. But for some reason, she felt apprehensive. Dread prickled her skin. All at once, the sky began to boil with a turbulent violet light and a thick tablecloth of steel gray cloud raced down the mountain. The day turned from sunny to sinister in seconds. Then one of the children shouted, Hey, look what I found! It was a wild goose with a broken wing. But instead of helping it, some of the children began tormenting it. Martine, who could never bear to see any creature hurt, tried to stop them. But in the dream, they turned on her instead. The next thing she knew, she was on the ground crying and the injured bird was in her arms. Then something very peculiar happened. Her hands, holding the wild goose, heated up to the point where they, had pra they were practically glowing and electricity crackled through her. She saw, in a swirl of smoke, black men in horned antelope masks and rhinoceros breathing fire and heard voices as old as time. She knew they wanted to speak to her, but she couldn't hear what they were saying. <clears throat> Suddenly, the bird stirred. Martine opened her palms, and it shook out its wings and flew into the violet sky. In the dream, she looked up smiling, but the other children didn't smile back. They stared at her with a mixture of horror and disbelief. Which, they chanted, which, 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 they began to chase her. Martine fled, sobbing up the mountain into a dark forest, but her legs were unimaginably heavy. Hooked thorns tore at her ankles, and she was losing her way in the cloud. And all the while, it was getting hotter and hotter. Then a hand grabbed her, and she began to scream and scream and scream. It was the sound of her own screams that finally woke Martine. She shot up in bed. It was pitch dark, and it took a few seconds for her to realize she'd been asleep. None of it had happened. There was no mountain and no bird. She was safely in her bed in Hampshire, England, with her parents sleeping soundly across the corridor. Heart pounding, she sank, sank back into the pillows. She was a bit dizzy, and she felt very, very hot. Hot? How could, how could, it, be, how could it possibly be hot? It was midwinter. Martine's eyes flew open. Something was wrong. Frantically, she fumbled for the bedside lamp, but for some reason it wasn't working. She sat up again. An orange light was flickering beneath the bedroom door, and gray ribbons of smoke were drifting up from it. Fire! 
yelled Martine. Fire! She leaped out of bed, caught her foot in the blankets, and crashed to the ground. Tears of panic sprang into her eyes. She wiped them away roughly. If I don't think clearly, she told herself, I'll never get out of here alive. The corner of the door turned molten red and broke away, and a plume of smoke poured in after it. Martine began coughing violently. She clawed at the floor of her yesterday's sweatshirt, discarded there when she put, when she put on her pajamas. Almost cheering with thankfulness when she found it immediately, she tied it around her face. She scrambled to her feet, heaved up the window, and leaned out into the starless night. What was she supposed to do? Jump? Martine stood, paralyzed with terror. Far below her, the snow glinted mockingly in the darkness. Behind her, the room was filling with smoke and fumes, and the fire was roaring like a factory furnace. It was blisteringly, murderously hot, so hot that she felt as if her pajamas were melting off her back. The window was the only way out. Swinging her legs over the sill, she reached out and grabbed a clump of ivy. It was as wet as lettuce and came away in her hand. Martine almost toppled after it. She tried again, this time not knocking away the packed snow and groping behind the vine for a pipe or a crevice or anything at all that would give that would give her a handhold. Nothing. Martine's eyes streamed. Moments remained between her and disaster, but she jumped back into the room, snatched the sheets off the bed, and knotted them together, tying one end to the, to the bed leg nearest the window. There was no time to test it. She just had to hope that it would hold. As fast as she dared, she climbed out of the window, clinging to the sheet rope with both hands. She knew very well that it wouldn't reach the ground, but it might get her a little closer. She was still high in the air when her hands, stiff as frozen fish sticks in the gusting ar arctic wind, lost their grip and she crashed into the snow. Martine dragged herself upright, shivering, and hobbled along the side of the house to the front. But as soon as she rounded the corner, she no longer thought about that. She was too busy taking in the appalling scene before her. Her home was a raging inferno. Flames leaped in every window and coils of smoke billowed into the night sky. A crowd had gathered on the lawn and all along the street. Doors were opening and more people were rushing to join them. Sirens announced the rapid approach of the fire department. Mom! Dad! yelled Martine and she ran around the side to the front of the house. Shocked faces turned in her direction. There was a collective gasp. The Allen's elderly next-door neighbor opened her mouth when she saw Martine rushing across the lawn, but no sound came out. Mr. and Mrs. Morrison, who lived farther up the street, were also rooted to the spot. But Mr. Morrison, a burly former rugby player, shook himself into, into action at the last moment and managed to catch Martine as she flew, flew by. Let me go, sobbed Martine. But even as she spoke, she knew it was too late. The walls of the house were collapsing into a molten heap. Within minutes, there was nothing left. The fire department had arrived, but the most they could do was put the flames out. Mrs. Morrison put her arms around Martine and held her tightly. I'm so sorry, my dear, she said. I'm so sorry. Others came over to console her, and Mr. Morrison gave her his coat to put on over her pajamas. Through the the screen of Martine's tears, the still glowing embers and bubbles of the fireman's foam shone, foam shone like rubies and diamonds in the fading night. Only a few hours ago, she'd been enjoying a birthday dinner with her parents. They'd made pancakes and filled them with almonds, bananas, and melted chocolate and shaped them into cones they could eat with their hands. Martine and her mom had laughed at her dad, David, who was talking so much that he hadn't noticed that his pancake was leaking chocolate down his shirt. Only one thing had happened that Martine now thought was strange. They'd been on their way up to bed. Martine's mom had kissed her and gone on ahead, and Martine was walking up the stairs with her dad. When they reached her bedroom door, he hugged her goodnight, ruffled her hair, and told her he loved her, just as he always did. But then, almost as if he sensed something was going to happen, he said something odd. You have to trust Martine. Everything happens for a reason. And Martine had smiled at him and thought how lovely her parents were, 
even if they were sometimes a little weird. And she'd gone into her room, not knowing that they were the last words he would ever say to her, not knowing she would never see either of her parents again. And that's the end of the chapter. Oh, excuse me while I go cry. I got my box of tissues over here. <laughs> we made it through the first chapter, guys. I feel like it can only go up from here, right? It has to. Oh. All right. I'll read chapter two to you guys soon. Have a good night.